Good morning everyone. Welcome once again to St Peter's Church in Newton in Mumbles. We gather together today to celebrate the Feast of the Resurrection of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. Today is now the fifth Sunday of Easter. We begin with our voluntary, which is Packlebell's Canon in D. We meet together as a family in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Alleluia! Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia! And so we open our hearts and our minds to him as we say, Heavenly Father, all hearts are open to you. No secrets are hidden from you. Purify us with the fire of your Holy Spirit, that we may love and worship you faithfully, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. God loved the world so much that he gave his only Son, that everyone who believes in him may not die, but have eternal life. And so let us pause for a moment now, and call to mind the ways in which we have failed to love God, to love our neighbour, and to love our own true self as we should. God always forgives us when we say we're sorry, and so let us confess our sins together as we say, Heavenly Father, we have sinned in thought, word and deed, and have failed to do what we ought to have done. We are sorry and truly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and lead us in his way to walk as children of light. Amen. <clears throat> Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy on you and set you free from sin, strengthen you in goodness and keep you in eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. <laughs>
said, today is now the fifth Sunday of Easter. This is the Collect, the prayer for today. Almighty God, who through your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, has overcome death and opened to us the gate of everlasting life, grant that by your grace going before us, you put into our minds good desires, so that by your continual help, we may bring them to good effect. Through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Our epistle reading is from the first letter of Peter. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Come to him, a living stone, though rejected by mortals, yet chosen and precious in God's sight. Like living stones, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, See, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. To you then who believe, he is precious. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the very head of the corner and a stone that makes them stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the word, as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We now have the first of our hymns, the hymn, Come Ye Faithful, Raise the Anthem.
Listen to the Gospel of Christ according to St John. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to his disciples, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen me. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak of my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. But if you do not, then believe me because of the works themselves. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> In St John's Gospel, there is what's, when you're studying theology or the New Testament, there is the long section on the Last Supper called the High Priestly Prayer. That's the name given to it. Jesus, on the last night of his night, of his life, he has the disciples gathered around him, the disciples and the others, and he talks to them. He tries to use that last night of his life to prepare them, to strengthen them, to reassure them, to teach them. It's partly a pep talk. It's also partly, I suppose, something that he knows when they see him die on the cross, they will be bereft. They've left everything to follow him. He knows they don't fully understand it. You can hear within that passage, I tried to put it across in the reading of it, the frustration that must have been there with Jesus. He's been saying these things again and again. And yet for the disciples, it's only really going to be then with hindsight after the resurrection that the things he has been saying fit properly into place and come to reassure and to comfort and to strengthen the disciples and across the centuries to strengthen and comfort and reassure us. And there can be few more reassuring statements there than Jesus on that last night talking to his disciples about the fact that where he is going, he is going to prepare a place for them and after he will return to take them with him. And of course that passage, this passage, I don't know how many times I've used uh, at, at funeral services, it's a service of enormous comfort that Jesus has gone before us. He has shared our life and shared our death and then risen again and gone to prepare a place for us. The comfort that comes from those words is enormous. Here is Jesus reassuring his disciples and here he is reassuring us as we face the reality of death. We are reassured 
that Jesus will come to take us to be with him. But the important thing, perhaps above all, is to realise what an extraordinary thing to say. Just because we may have heard it many times, just because it may be reassuring to us, does not take away how extraordinary it is. He stands there in front of his disciples and the others and he talks about what is going to happen. Now, if anyone were to stand in front of us at a dinner party or sit at a dinner party and say, oh, well, actually, uh, if you've seen me, you have seen God the Father. I'm going and I'm going to prepare a place for you through eternity. If someone said that to us, what would we think? Logically speaking, as the great theologian C.S. Lewis pointed out, there are three options there, aren't there? We would either think, well, this person is absolutely mad. They've got delusions of grandeur. They think they're God. They're not God. And therefore, what they're saying is, is meaningless. And we'd feel sorry for them, really. Or we might think, well, who is this person? This person is very dangerous. This person, if he was saying these things to people who, who believed and were gullible in what was saying, would be leading them astray. He'd be giving them false hope, presumably giving them false hope in order that in some way he could get control over them. But logically, there is a third option, that the person who is saying these things is actually telling the truth. Either, put simply, he's mad or bad, or who he says he is. On that last night of his life, Jesus speaks to his disciples, and yes, the comfort is there, but also the challenge is there across the centuries for us as well. Do we think that Jesus, on that last night, was saying those things because he was mad, he had delusions of grandeur, thinking he was someone that he wasn't. Do we think that he was bad? That he was deliberately trying to lead people astray by making promises which were completely untrue? I can't really see how that can be equated with someone who so clearly knew that he was going to be executed within a very few hours. He had nothing to gain from it. But then, if he wasn't saying those things because he was mad or bad, we are only left with the joyous but very challenging truth that he actually was who he said he was. That in seeing him, Philip was indeed seeing the Father that he was God in human form, revealing to his disciples in his life, in his words, in his death, in his resurrection, and revealing to us the very nature of God himself and how things should be. If we are to take the comfort of the promise that we will be with him, and that there are indeed many dwelling places because he, as the incarnate Son of God, knows there are many dwelling places and will indeed be true to his promise and come and take us to be with him and reunite us with those we have loved but lost. If we are to take the comfort from that, we also have to take the challenge as well. Because if we want to put our trust that what he is saying there is true, then what about the other things he said? The other teaching, the teaching that brings us face to face with the reality of what God wants us to do and say and think and be. We can take the comfort, but we also have to take the challenge. In the words of Jesus, he is laying before us how we should behave. If you like, we could call it the Maker's Instructions. He is laying before us what we were created to do and to be. 
I think sadly sometimes the church has, has got this rather out of kilter and put across the idea, oh well Jesus has told us what we should do and we'll be punished if we don't do it. But as Jesus has just said in that great high priestly prayer, I've come that you may have life and have it abundantly. Just as Jesus gives the reassurance that this life is not all that, that there is, he is saying to the disciples, he wants them to truly enjoy and be fulfilled and understand the real meaning. And that the real meaning and purpose and joy of life comes in fulfilling and living by the Maker's instructions. I suppose it's true in so many ways, isn't it? If we were to buy a, a high-performance car and to fill it with low-grade fuel, we really wouldn't get from the car what we should be getting. The same for us as human beings. We all know that we can get by eating fast food, but that our bodies work so much better when we eat healthily as we are indeed intended to do. In the same way, there are many people who have gone their own way, sometimes sadly people who have done terrible things, which surely is not what God would wish them to do, but they're not suddenly pulled up and stopped. We have the ability to choose, to see our own way, to do our own thing. But here we have placed before us the fact that if we really want to say, yes, I want to enjoy the promises, the reassurance, the hope, I have to take seriously the one who gives those to me. And I have to take seriously his challenge. His challenge that tells me how I ought to live, what I ought to say and do, and how I'm called to grow, as Peter talks about in that epistle, to grow and to become someone who has gone beyond being a mere child in the faith into someone who is rising to the stature of the fullness of Christ, as St. Paul calls it, as we grow to become like Jesus, to share his loving, forgiving, caring, self-sacrificing nature. As we become like him, we learn truly to become the people we were created to be and to transform the world, which of course is what he wishes us to do through his grace working within us. On this fifth Sunday of Easter, let us rejoice in the wonderful promises that we are made, but let us ask God to understand and to strengthen us to live life as we were created to and to bring his kingdom in our lives, in our homes, in our community, in our world. Should we pray about these things? Let us pray to our Heavenly Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus, that God's will may be done in the world and in the lives of those for whom we pray. Father, we pray for all God's people, May we faithfully proclaim Jesus as the way, the one who speaks with truth, and the one who gives life abundantly. We pray for the church throughout the world, for John, our Archbishop. We pray for Christians everywhere, that by our words and our actions, we may show Jesus, that he may indeed be the way, the truth and the life for us and for all people. Father, we pray for the leaders of the world, for all who hold authority and power. We pray that you will guard them, 
and guide them and direct them in these troubled times. We pray for all who have positions of authority over others, not merely in running nations, but through employing others, through caring for others, those who have responsibility for others in families, for all who have to make decisions on behalf of others, that they may indeed see the way, that they may be truthful, and that their decisions may bring life in its fullness to others. Father, we pray for those who cry out for any reason. We pray for those who are distressed, for those who are in pain, for those who are despairing or grieving. Heavenly Father, may they know the presence of your Son walking beside them to bring them reassurance and comfort. And we pray, Father, that you will play our part, help us to play our part in bringing reassurance and comfort to others, particularly in these isolated times. And as we pray for our own response and the healing that we can bring through our words and our actions, we pray for those who work so hard to alleviate the illness, the pain and the suffering of others in hospitals and at home. We pray too for those who seek to alleviate the pain of others through research. And we pray, Father, for those whose loneliness and isolation are so much deepened at this time. Father, we pray finally for those who have departed this life. We remember the great promises of your Son and we rejoice in them. And we pray though that as we put our trust in those promises, that we may indeed put our trust in all that he says to us, that we may live our lives as you would have us live them, that we may bring your kingdom here on earth, that your will may be done here, even as it is in heaven. And we pray that one day, Father, through your mercy, you will set us free from our failings and failures, and reunite us with those we have loved but lost a while. Father, we ask our prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus said, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. The peace of the Lord be always with you. We now have our offertory hymn, the hymn, To God Be the Glory, Great Things He Has Done.
celebrate together the gifts and the grace of God. We take this bread, we take this wine to follow Christ's example and obey his command. The Lord is here, his spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts, we lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. True and living God, the source of life for all creation, you have made us in your own image. Always and everywhere we give you thanks through Jesus Christ our Lord, because in his victory over death a new age has dawned. The long reign of sin is ended. A broken world is being renewed, and we are once again made whole. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we praise your glorious name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the heart. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed are you, almighty God, because on the night he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given you thanks, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. When he had given you thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. We proclaim the mystery of Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come in glory. Therefore, loving God, recalling now the sacrifice of Christ, your Son, once for all upon the cross, and the triumph of his resurrection, we ask you to accept this, our sacrifice of praise. Send your Holy Spirit on us and on these gifts that we may be fed with the body and blood of your Son and be filled with your life and goodness. Unite us in Christ and give us your peace, that we may do your work and be his body in the world. Through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory are yours, almighty Father, for ever and ever. Amen. We join together in the words which Jesus himself taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body. 
for we all share in one bread. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, grant us peace. Alleluia, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. We now have our communion anthem. Morning has broken. I'm sure you'll agree with me that that was very beautiful. I think it, a, a timely place, although their names are always put there at the end of the service, the virtual choir, to thank those who, and it does take quite a long time to sing down the telephone, uh, it's not an easy thing to do. We thank them for their hard work. And the, the first verse there was sung by Chloe and Maddie, um, that was indeed very beautiful and also of course we thank Phil who spends hours trying to get them all together to get them in time uh, it's an extraordinary achievement and well, we thank them very sincerely eternal God you've nourished us with your Easter sacraments fill us with your spirit and make us all one peace and love. We ask this in the name of Jesus the Lord. Amen. God the Father, by whose glory Christ was raised from the dead, give you joy and strengthen you to walk with him in his risen life. And the blessing of Almighty God the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be upon you, your homes and the people that you love today and always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Alleluia, alleluia. 
in the name of Christ. Alleluia, alleluia, amen. We hope you have a wonderful and safe week and we conclude our service with our voluntary by Bach, his prelude in G minor. Thank you.